The Kena Upanishad is a Vedic Sanskrit text classified as one of the primary or Mukya Upanishads that is embedded inside the last section of the Talavakara Brahmanam of the Samaveda. It is listed as number two in the Muktika, the canon of the 108 Upanishads of Hinduism. The Kena Upanishad was probably composed sometime around the middle of the first millennium BCE. It has an unusual structure where the first 13 are verses composed as a metric poem, followed by 15 prose paragraphs of main text plus 6 prose paragraphs of epilogue. Paul Dusan suggests that the latter prose section of the main text is far more ancient than the poetic first section, and Kena Upanishad bridged the more ancient prose Upanishad era with the metric poetic era of Upanishads that followed. Kena Upanishad is notable in its discussion of Brahman with attributes and without attributes, and for being a treatise on purely conceptual knowledge. It asserts that the efficient cause of all the gods, symbolically envisioned as forces of nature, is Brahman. This has made it a foundational scripture to Vedanta school of Hinduism, both the theistic and monistic sub-schools after varying interpretations. The Kena Upanishad is also significant in asserting the idea of spiritual man. Soul is a wonderful being that even gods worship. Atman soul exists. And Knowledge and spirituality are the goals and intense longing of all creatures. Etymology <inaudible> <inaudible> Sanskrit, kena literally means, depending on the object-subject context, by what, by whom, whence, how, why, from what cause. This root of kena, in the sense of, by whom, or, from what cause is found the inquisitive first verse of the Kena Upanishad as follows The Kena Upanishad belongs to the Talavakara Brahmana of Sama Veda, giving the etymological roots of an alternate name of Talavakara Upanishad for it. In ancient and medieval era Indian texts, the Kena Upanishad is also referred to as the Kenapanishad Sanskrit, Kenapanasat, Kenapanasat. Chronology The chronology of Kena Upanishad, like other Vedic texts, is unclear and contested by scholars. All opinions rest on scanty evidence, an analysis of archaism, style and repetitions across texts, driven by assumptions about likely evolution of ideas, and on presumptions about which philosophy might have influenced which other Indian philosophies. Phillips dates Kena Upanishad as having been composed after Brihadaranyaka, Chandogya, Isha, Taittiriya and Aitareya pre-6th century BCE, but before Katha, Mandaka, Prasna, Mandukya, Svetasvatara and Maitri Upanishads, as well as before the early Buddhist Pali and Jaina canons, Renata posits a view similar to Philip's, with slightly different ordering, placing Kena chronological composition in the third group of ancient Upanishads. Paul Dusan considers Kena Upanishad to be bridging a period of prose composition and fusion of poetic creativity with ideas. Winternitz considers the Kena Upanishad as pre Buddhist, pre Jaina literature. The text is likely from about the middle of 1st millennium BCE. Many of the ideas found in Kena Upanishads have more ancient roots. For example, the ideas in verse 2 of Kena Upanishad are found in the oldest Brihadaranyaka Upanishads chapter 4.4, as well as the second oldest Chandogya Upanishads chapter 8.12. <laughs> Structure Kena Upanishad has three parts, 13 verses in the first part, 15 paragraphs in the second part, and 6 paragraphs in the epilogue. These are distributed in four khandas, khanda sections or volumes. The first khanda has 8 verses, the second has 5 verses. The third khanda has 12 paragraphs, while the fourth khanda has the remaining 9, 3 paragraphs of main text and 6 paragraphs of the epilogue. The first two khandas of Kena Upanishad are poems, the last two are prose, with one exception. Paragraph 9 is prose and structurally out of place, which has led scholars to state that the paragraph 9 was inserted or is a corrupted version of the original manuscript in a more modern era. Another odd structural feature of Kena Upanishad's poetic khandas is verse 3, which has eight lines typically marked as 3a and 3b, while all other poetic verses in the first two sections are only four lines of mathematical metric construction. There are some differences in the positioning of Kena Upanishad in manuscripts discovered in different parts of India. 
It is, for example, the ninth chapter of Talavakara Brahmana in South Indian manuscripts and is mentioned in the Basya commentary by Shankara, while the Burnell manuscript of sections of Sama Veda places it in the tenth Anuvaka of the fourth chapter inside Jaiminiya Brahmana. The Kena Upanishad is accepted as part of Sama Veda, but it is also found in manuscripts of Atharva collection. The difference between the two versions is minor and structural. In Sama Veda manuscripts, the Kena Upanishad has four sections, while the Atharva manuscripts show no such division into sections. Topic: <laughs> Contents. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Nature of knowledge, first khanda. The Kena Upanishad opens by questioning the nature of man, the origins, the essence and the relationship of him with knowledge and sensory perception. It then asserts that knowledge is of two types, empirical and conceptual. Empirical knowledge can be taught, described and discussed. Conceptual axiomatic knowledge cannot, states Kena Upanishad. Pure, abstract concepts are learnt and realized instead wherein it mentions that the highest reality is Brahman. In verse 4, Kena Upanishad asserts that Brahman cannot be worshipped, because it has no attributes and is unthinkable, indescribable, eternal, all-present reality. That what man worships is neither Atman Brahman nor the path to Atman Brahman. Rather, Brahman is that which cannot be perceived as empirical reality. It is that which hears, the sound in ears, sees, the view in eyes, speaks, the words of speech, smells. The aroma in breath comprehends the meaning in thought. The Atman Brahman is in man, not that which one worships outside. Woodburn interprets the first khanda of Kena Upanishad to be describing Brahman in a manner that faith is described in Christianity. In contrast, Shankara interprets the first khanda entirely as monistic. <laughs> Self awakening is the source of inner strength, second khanda. The second khanda of Kena Upanishad starts with prose paragraph 9 that inserts a theistic theme, asserting that the worshipping of Brahman, described in the first khanda, is deception because that is phenomenal form of Brahman, one among gods. Verses 10-13, return to the poetic form, and the theme of what knowing Brahman is and what knowing Brahman is not. Verses 12 and 13 of Kena describe the state of self-realization moksha, stating that those who are self-awakened gain inner strength, see the spiritual oneness in every being, and attain immortality. Charles Johnston refers to the state as the spiritual man. Topic. Allegory of three gods and one goddess, third and fourth khandas The third section of Kenna is a fable, set in prose unlike the first two poetic sections. The fable is an allegory, states Paul Dusan. The allegory is, states the theosophist Charles Johnston, a delicious piece of Sanskrit prose, fascinating in its simple style, and one of the deepest passages in all of Upanishads. The fable begins by asserting that in a war between gods and demons, the Brahmin won victory for the gods. The gods, however, praised themselves for the victory, saying, Of us is this victory, of us is this might and glory. The Brahmin noticed this. It revealed itself before the gods, who did not recognize and know it. The gods said, What is this wonderful being? They delegated god Agni fire to go discover who this wonderful being is. Agni rushed to Brahman. The Brahmin asked, Who are you? Agni replied, I am Agni, knower of beings. Brahman asked, If so, what is the source of your power? Agni replied, I am able to burn whatever is on earth. The Brahman then laid a piece of grass before Agni, and said, Burn this, then. Agni rushed to the grass and tried his best to burn it. He failed. He turned back and returned to the gods. Agni told the gods, I am unable to discover what this wonderful being is. The gods then nominated god Vayu to go, and Explore, O oh Vayu, what this wonderful being is. Vayu rushed to Brahman. The Brahman asked, Who are you? Vayu replied, I am Vayu, I am Matarizvan, what fills the aerial space around Mother Earth, mover in space. Brahman asked, If so, what is the source of your power? Vayu replied, I am able to carry or pull whatever is on Earth. 
The Brahmin then laid a piece of grass before Vayu, and said, "'Carry this, then.' Vayu rushed to the grass and tried his best to lift and carry it away. He failed. He turned back and returned to the gods. Vayu told his fellow gods, "'I am unable to discover what this wonderful being is.' The gods then turned to god Indra lightning, god of might, to go, and "'Explore, O mighty one, what this wonderful being is.' So be it," said Indra. Indra went to Brahman. There, in the place of Brahman, he found a beautiful woman with knowledge. Her name was Uma. Indra asked Uma, What is this wonderful being? Goddess Uma replied, That is the Brahman, that is the one who obtained victory, though gods praise themselves for it. Indra then knew. The tradition holds that Agni, Vayu and Indra are elevated above all other gods, respected first in ceremonies and rituals, because these three met and experienced the Brahman first. Indra is most celebrated because he knew Brahman first, among all gods. Translations by Dusan and by Johnston Johnston states, as does the Hindu scholar Adi Shankara, that this simple story is loaded with symbolism. The Brahman, the three gods selected from numerous Vedic gods, and choice of the one goddess from many, the goddess Uma revealing spiritual knowledge about Brahman rather than the Brahman itself, as well the phrasing of the type, the wonderful being, are all allegorically referring to the spiritual themes of the Upanishads. Agni embodies fire, and symbolizes, natural self, with vital fire in all beings and everything. Vayu embodies space that envelops empirical existence, symbolizes, mental self, akin to thoughts about everything. Indra embodies lightning, light and illumination, thus symbolizing, causal conscious self, with light of truth that discerns correct knowledge from incorrect. The Brahman is Atman, the eternal. The war between gods and demons is symbolism for the war between good and evil. Devas themselves are allegorical reference to sensory and intellectual capabilities of man, with the war symbolizing challenges a man faces in his journey through life. Kena Upanishad's allegory is suggesting that empirical actions, such as destruction by fire or moving a being from one place to another, does not lead to knowing the essence of the subject, the wonderful being. The Upanishad is allegorically reminding that a victory of good over evil, is not of manifested self, but of the good, the eternal, the Atman Brahman. Topic. Epilogue, Fourth Khanda The epilogue in Kena Upanishad is contained in last six paragraphs of the text. It asserts the timelessness and awareness of Brahman to be similar to moments of wondrous awe. In life, such as the focused exclamation one makes upon witnessing lightning flash in the sky, or the focused, ah, recollection of a knowledge in one's mind of a memory from past. The goal of spiritual knowledge, of self-awareness, is wonderful, characterized by an intense longing for it in all creatures, states Kena Upanishad. The knowledge of Atman Brahman is Tadvanam transcendental happiness, blissfulness. In the final paragraphs, Kena Upanishad asserts ethical life as the foundation of self-knowledge and of Atman Brahman. To Sai Tapo Dhamma Karmeti Pratistha Veda Sarvangani Satamayatanam, Tapas, Dhamma, Work, these are the foundations, the Vedas are the limbs of the same, the truth is its fulcrum. Topic. Reception Adi Shankara wrote two commentaries on Kenapanishad. One is called Kenapanisad Padabhasya and the other is Kenapanisad Vakubhasya. In his commentary on the third khanda of Kena Upanishad, Shankara equates Atman Brahman with Ishvara Parameshvara. This equality is repeated by Shankara in Brihadaranyaka Upanishad Bhasya in verses 3.7.3 and IV.4.15, in the Bhasya on Chandogya Upanishads verses I 1.1 and V18.1, Katha Upanishads Bhasya on him 11.2.13, Anandanyana also wrote a commentary on Kena Upanishad. Till late 19th century, the commentary of Shankara and Anandanyana were the only implied source of the existence of Kena Upanishad, as original manuscripts of Upanishad were believed to have been lost, after Dara Shiko published a Persian translation of it. This changed in 1878, when Burnell found a manuscript and later published it. The French scholar Anquital d'Operan published a Latin translation from the Persian translated version with the title, Kin while Windishman and others published a German translation of the Kena Upanishad. 
Colebrook, Poli, Weber, Rohr, and Goff are among the scholars who have discussed it. George Haas includes a reading of Kenna Upanishad, along with other primary Upanishads and the Bhagavad Gita, as essential to understanding the wonderful old treasures of Hindu theosophic lore. Edward Washburn Hopkins states that the aphoristic mention of Tapo Dhamma Karma in closing prose parts of Kena Upanishad suggests that ethical precepts of yoga were well accepted in Indian spiritual traditions by the time Kena Upanishad was composed. Similarly, Shramali cites Kena Upanishad, among other ancient Sanskrit texts, to state that knowledge seeking and education system was formalized by 1st millennium BCE in India, highlighting among many examples, the question answer structure of 1st Khanda of Kena Upanishad. Fred Dalmar cites Kena Upanishad's opening lines to state that Upanishad's primary focus is Atman Brahman soul, self, in Hindu theosophy. These opening lines state, Sarvam Brahmaupanizadam Brahman is all of which the Upanishads speak. David Stoll composed Sonata for Two Pianos in 1990 inspired by the opening verses of Kena Upanishad. References S. Radhakrishnan. The Principal Upanishads. George Allen and Onwin. London. Third Imprint. 1969. Eight Upanishads. Volume 1. With the Commentary of Sankaracharya. T.R. Swami Gambarananda. Advaita Ashrama. Calcutta. 1957. Sri Aurobindo, The Upanishads. 1. Sri Aurobindo Ashram, Pondicherry, 1972. Kino Upanishad. 2. Swami Chinmayananda. Chinmaya Mission. Upadhyaya, Ganga Prasad. Translation. 1904. Kena Upanishad. Sarvadeshik Arya Pratinidhi, Delhi. Topic. External links Text and translation The Kena Upanishad with Shankara's commentary translated by S. Siddharama Sastri, online ebook Kena Upanishad Robert Hume, translator, Oxford University Press, pages 335-340 Talavakara or Kena Upanishad Max Muller translator Oxford University Press pages 147 to 153 Kena or Talavakara Upanishad Eduard Rohr translator Bibliotheca Indica volume 15 number 41 and 50 pages 75 to 88 Kena Upanishad multiple translations Raja Ram Mohan Roy Johnston Nikilananda Kena Upanishad in Sanskrit Kena Upanishad Another Archive of Nikilananda Translation Kena Upanishad Vidyavashaspati V. Panoli Translator Kena Upanishad Sanderson Beck Translator Recitation Kena Upanishad Recited by P.T. Ganesh Vidyalankar With Instrumental Music Kena Upanishad Public Domain Audiobook at LibriVox Resources Video, audio classes, reference texts, discussions and other study material on Kena Upanishad at Vedanta Hub.